Uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, I was talking to some of the staff tonight, if I was thinking of some place opposite of Iowa, it would be the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I think <laughs> this, this, it's got to be no, not one thing in common between the two places, so th this will be a nice journey for you. Uh, and I just got back last week from the Congo, so it's still fresh in my mind. So the, uh, the project we, we are going to talk about is, and just to give you some idea of the location, this is, where's the, where's the point? This is the, where our project is really the heart of Africa. It is the dead center heart of it. This is the heart of doc, darkness from Joseph Conrad. Henry Morton Stanley crossed right through here across the Upulu River, and he, and he marveled, he says, this environment has to hold some of the marbles of Africa we have not discovered yet. And that was in 1888. The rainforest there is not what you think of Brazilian rainforest, flat floods. This is a very high alt, 2,500 feet above sea level, very rolling hills, very dry soil. It rains all the time, but the soil is very porous. It drains well, so there's no, there's no swamps, it's just lots of trees and lots of rainfall. Things can grow. So it's a very fertile environment for biodiversity because there's not these extremes of wet and dry. It's got, there's, there's rain, there's dry season, but there's always moisture for things to grow. Like most rainforests, very little light penetrates the ground. And the wildlife benefits from these giant forest trees falling. Every time a tree falls, it clears about five acres. And that's when the young trees and fruits, and that's really the food. And the human ha habitants of this area for thousands of years have been farming little plots. They abandon them, and the animals, for, for the, the human occupation and natural tree falls are what really benefits the wildlife population. There's very little food in these canopies unless you're a monkey in the top. That's where you get all the food. So that's what, it's a really different world. The biodiversity of, of the, the Congo, and just for history, this was Zaire, and before Zaire was the Belgian Congo. This area has always been a very isolated part of Africa. It is the most biodiverse country in Africa. It has no, more mammal species, reptile species, plant species than any other country. And the forest you saw, 13% of the world's rainforests occur in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's a very important oxygen generator. I like to see people take a deep breath. You're breathing oxygen from the Congo. Believe it or not, you are. This is one of the great oxygen producers in the world, this rainforest. The okapi it was the last animal discovered, and major animal discovered in Africa in 1901. It's got an interesting story behind it. The governor of Uganda, his name was Harry Johnston, and the okapi is Okapi Johnstoni in his honor, but he was a very sickly young boy, couldn't go to school, so he spent every day at the London Zoo drawing, teaching himself to draw. He became a phenomenal artist. His, he regained his health, became a military officer, and was awarded to become the governor of Uganda when the British Empire had Uganda. And he got a little patch of skin from the rump of the okapi, came out of the, the forest of the Congo, and he, and he sent it to the, to the museum in London. They said, oh, here's a forest zebra. We, they they described the okapi as a zebra because it had the stripes. And a few, he kept trying to get more information about this. The, the pygmies in this area, which we'll talk about, they called it oapi. They called it oapi was the name the pygmies had for this animal, and they knew it. They knew what it was, but no Westerner had ever seen it. Eventually he got a skin, a, a, an officer of the military the Bel of the Belgian army uh, brought out a skin to Uganda and he gave him the skin. He sent it to London, but he drew these animals from a skin that had no feet attached. I think the ears were missing and tail and he did an unbelievable, remarkable job just from a flat, dried skin on the floor, he, he uh, drew the animals. Then when they saw, they realized that this was a giraffe species. So because of the, of the isolated location of the okapi, it's only found in this one area of, of, the, of the Congo and only one place in Africa, the Belgians set up a, a capture station. These were the original okapi came out for the zoos in New York, London, Chicago, where the first animals in the 20s that get okapi came from the Apulu station, which was set up by the Belgians in, uh, when they occupied the country. And this is right before uh, the revolution, 1961 was the independence of uh, when Zaire became independent from uh, Belgian Congo. At first it was called actually a, 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 a Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo was their first name before Mobutu got in charge. He's the one who changed the name to Zaire. So actually the, this was a return to the original name, what they're called now, after their independence from Belgium. So the, the Apulu station was set up because that's where the copy were found. It was in the middle of the rainforest. But at that time, the Belgians had built very good roads, had an international airport in Kisangani, Jet, you know, planes could fly in there, so the animals actually were actually transported out of this area uh, very easily at that time. 
The location of the station is, so this is the Pulu River, which is a river that flows through uh, the, rain, the Atori Rainforest. It intersects the Atori River, which flows into the Congo River. The second largest river system on Earth besides the Amazon is the Congo River Basin. And this is the uh, very rocky soil, and all the water goes, and these are very fast-flowing rivers. They're very fast, because it's, it's quite a drop. You can see it's going down. There's rapids. It's, it's, there's a, quite a drop on the rivers. I went there in 1987 to start the project. Uh, I was joined with a, a Swiss couple and two Congolese. We started the project together in 1987. And the Mbuti Pygmies are the native uh, group of, uh, of indigenous people that live in this area. They are true forest people. And uh, I'll give you a little more detail about them in a second. The Mbuti, they, they live, uh, they're hunter-gatherers. These are one of the last uh, you know, true hunter-gathering societies. They live in leaf huts. They're, Nomadic in a certain uh, family uh, area, they each tri each uh, I'm not going to call them tribes, but every relation of families lives in a certain area. They have they each have their own honey tree. When the honeys, they go to their honey tree. They have a certain area of hunting and gathering. Uh, they are uh, the smallest people on earth. The, the the men are about four foot eight. The women are about four feet three inches tall. These are the smallest people on earth, uh, and uh, there's not a hindrance to them because they were they they evolved for this environment. They're the same size as the game trails. When I'm in the forest with them, they just laugh at me because I'm, I'm, everything's in my face, but there's, no, there's nothing in their face because that's where all the animals walk and they just use the animal paths and they're the same size. They just walk and they trot and they got this wonderful little trot. It, it's, they hard, it hardly seem like they're moving, but they're covering. You just got to struggle to keep up with them. They just fly through the forest. The, the Mbuti uh, pygmies are net hunters. This uh, gentleman here has a, a net. Uh, and what they, they have the dogs, these are related to Basenjis, the barkless dogs, and they, they will string these nets out in the forest, and the men on tree branches and hook it up, and the men stand behind the nets with their spears, and the women and children and the dogs drive the game towards the nets. And the nets are only about, you know, three feet high, so just only small, and these are small dikers, different types of small animals, uh, the blue diker, which is in this area, is like rabbits in the rainforest. They're everywhere. So it's, a, it's, their, it's their major food source. These are subsistence hunters. They only hunt when they're hungry. I've been in a village with them, and they, somebody says, let's go hunting. So everybody just grabs the nets, and they just go, and they get what they need, and they come back, and they're done. And that's it, you know. So the main thing is not to allow them to get into commercial hunting, because they're so good at it, they can catch a lot of animals very quickly if they need, if they're, somebody pays them for them. So we really try to dissuade it from get them in the people from, it's not their fault. We try to have people that's against the law to buy the diker, it's called Mboko, the diker meat's called Mboko, to buy Mboko from the pygmies is against the law because that encourages them to, to overutilize the resource. You can see my, me next to this is a group of, uh, uh, of, of, of pygmy men, and these guys are unbelievably strong. They go up a 100-foot tree in five seconds. They just go right up a tree like you wouldn't believe. They can go all day long. They're unbelievably athletic. As they, live, they have to be to live off the land. It's just amazing what they have to do. And this is a ceremony of the men going, of the young boys going into, for their puberty, for their, you know, going to the, the special ceremony. And it's just every couple years they do it. So they, it, actually the tall person is a Bantu, a, 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 not a pygmy, but they do it together. They, if there's a certain age class, there's really a, a a commensal relationship between the, the Bantu, which just means, uh, you know, a, like they want to say normal person, and the pygmy, so the, but they have a relationship because they both need each other's goods and services. So over centuries, they evolved a relationship where the Bantu are in the little villages with their farms, the pygmies in the forest, and they trade goods back and forth. And this has been going on a long time, and it's actually been beneficial to both sides. The reason we're there is the Okapi is the symbol of all the wildlife of the Congo. All that beautiful biodiversity I showed you, the people have, of the Congo have chosen this. It's, 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 when you're working in a, in a developing country on a species conservation, it has to be respected and honored by the people that live there. If, they're, if they don't, you're going to have a hard time selling that this is important for them to conserve. But they, they believe this animal is unique. They believe it's only found in the Congo. They have a lot of pride around the Okapi. So it's actually the symbol, this is a, the ICCN stands for Institute in the Congo for the Conservation of Nature. It's like our natural parks and fish and game all rolled into one. They're responsible for all the wildlife protected areas in the country, government agency. And the, the leaf for the forest and the okapi is a symbol of their, of their department. So the okapi is, the okapi is very difficult to see in the forest. I was talking to Jesse, I've been in the forest many times and never seen one. I've heard them, 
Uh, they have tremendous, uh, you see the size of the ears. They can hear everything in the, in the you know, the, a mile before you get there, they know you're there. <laughs> they have a tremendous sense of smell. And their, and their defense, their, their major predator is a leopard. There's a high density of leopards. Leopards are the major predator of Okapi. Uh, humans do not really bother them. But any type of disturbance, they move away from. And they, they smell it here. So before you get there, they're, they're long gone. And even the uh, Mbuti pygmies have a time, tough time getting close to them. They don't hunt them. Uh, the Okapi and the chimpanzee, they feel, are, are, have ancestor spirits. They're, an, they're their ancestors. They honor them, they don't hunt them. Uh, so they actually, in this area, the Mbutis, and, and there's lots of chimpanzees and lots of Okapi because of this relationship with the, uh, with the people. And the pygmies could get close to these animals if they wanted to, if they really worked at it, because they're such excellent forest people. They know how to read sign. They're so quiet. They don't make a sound when they're going through the forest. They're just amazing. They can do that. You can see the relationship with giraffe here. They have an 18-inch long tongue, just like giraffes, the okapi. Uh, every, all the food is within reach in the rainforest, and so it's, you don't have to be tall, have a long neck like a giraffe to reach it. Everything is within reach. They eat about 150 different species of leaves. And I always wonder why okapi were so big. You know, so why is an animal so big? The food is everywhere. From the, you know, there's food everywhere for these guys. Why, they have, why are they so big? Well, they, they don't use trails. They just push their way through. They have to eat about 16 hours a day. They have to forage, grabbing leaf after leaf. And all the leaves have toxins in them. So they cannot eat too much of any one leaf. If they do, they get sick. So they know they eat a little bite of this. They go over here and get a bite of that. And they get a bite of this. And they constantly do this. We've done studies where we try to lower the number of species we give to them, and they get sick real quick. So it's all these plants have toxins. They have to buffer them with other plants. So they're always so the size of the okapi is that it has to move in the rainforest, and it just can't say I'm I'm going to go around and get over there. No, it just goes straight. And there's a great relation between elephants and okapi because I've always seen okapi track inside elephant tracks. Because elephants are the bulldozers of the rainforest. They just knock everything over. And the okapi say, well, this is a free ride. They'll get me, you know, just follow, they follow the element. So it's actually, I always look for okapi track, and they always find them inside elephant tracks when you win the forest. So. And the elephants are the same way. You don't get close to them because they, they are, of course, they are persecuted by humans. So they are very afraid of the human smell. They're long gone. So, so this is just a a video of a copy, one of our research centers, and you just see how they move. And I want you to just notice how they, you'll see when it starts grooming itself with its tongue. The females weigh about 700 to 800 pounds, and the males about 500 to 600. So the females are bigger, and the reason for that is they have to provide milk for the calves and they have to eat a lot more. So they, can't, they have to really move a lot. So you watch the tongue. <laughs> They can, they can reach every part of their body with their tongue. <laughs> and, and the coat you see them, if you touch an okapi, you'll get a, a film on your hands. And it's a, in, a, in the Gaur, the wild cat of India, have the same. It's a natural insect. Repeat. If the insect lands on this, it get, gums up their feet. So they don't like to get there. Okapi calves are very small when they're born, about 25 to 35 pounds. And if you notice, most wild animals have small babies. They can't spend a lot of time giving birth. They have to pop this baby up. They have to get going and they have to get moving. If, it's, if they're in labor a long time, they're vulnerable and the calf's not big, if it's too big. So this is a, this is a brand new two-day-old calf at, uh, at our breeding center. The calves uh, have a very unusual biology. The whole biology of the okapi is to avoid leopard predation. The calf finds a nest in the forest. The mother will not go near the baby, doesn't want to bring it sent to the baby. They use ultrasound, sound below our hearing, and they, and they communicate. And in studies, and we've had NASA, and, and so these animals are always talking. We can't hear it. The mother calls the baby out. The baby nurses, goes back, and then she goes walking to, in the, to produce more milk. And this baby will stay in the nest for five to six months. And when it finally, th this calf here is, it's too young. You see how solid they are and how they grow. This is, a not, this is a month old calf, how fast they grow. The milk is very high in fat. So the whole strategy here is to get this baby to a size big enough where it can avoid leopard predation, but also keep it hidden and keep it away from leopards. So the mother doesn't go near the baby, only to nurse it and doesn't bring any, her scent to the nest. Their first uh, muconiums, their first stool, doesn't happen to 50, 60 days of age. Normally it happens the first one or two days in a mammal. 50 to 60 days, that's not to have any smell in the nest area of this okapi. So 
And so when the okapi is about six months old, five, six months old, it starts following its mother, it's already three quarters grown. And we've, we've, uh, we've, had a, we've caught okapi and seen okapi with leopard scars on her back where okapi, or leopard gets on her back and rakes her back. And what the okapi does, it runs and tries to rub the, okapi, the leopard off on the, all the vines and underbrush. So if it's, if it's small, the leopard can knock it over and it can kill it very easily. So, that, so this, is, this, this unusual biology is just to avoid because the leopards are so dense there, it's, it's uh, very unusual. The project really what we're trying to do there is to sustain this rich diversity of wildlife, plant, and human communities in this forest. And uh, this was, when we started this project, there was no protected areas. The Aturi Forest has 175,000 square kilometers. It's a very big chunk of land. And this is where the okapi is found. And now we found them in other, rain, in other forests. Outside of this Aturi Forest recently, but still this is the major habitat for the okapi in, in, the, in the world. Uh, you don't see okapi, so I say, how do you know there's okapi there? Well, you walk a lot, you do transects, and you look for fecal samples on the floor. And then they have a very unusual pellet. And actually, we've done studies, every okapi's pellet's unique. If you really know, you can look at it, you can actually tell individual animals by the shape of their pellets. It's really amazing. And we train the guards and the people to do the censuses. And a new camera trap, recently we've been using camera traps to document them in certain areas with camera traps. This is a young animal. See the color? I was talking about the color. This is a young animal. See the, the young animals have this lighter brown like your stuffed animals, but adults have this real dark chestnut color. So uh, in 1987, uh, working with the World Wildlife Fund, the Wildlife Conservation Society, we had the Okapi Wildlife uh, Reserve was created in 1992 and became a World Heritage Site in 1996. And World Heritage Site is very important. It, it provides funding through UNESCO, which is a UN agency. So it allows you to get funding from the global community for a biological, culturally special place, which the Okapi Wildlife Reserve is. But unfortunately, in 1997, it became a World Heritage Site in danger. That's when the Civil War erupted, when uh, Mobutu was overthrown by Lauren Kabila, who was later assassinated, and his son uh, is, is now the president of the Congo, and he's not a very good one. But, uh, this was a very tough time. We, we were actually able to function during this time because we had Ugandan army, Rwandan army. Most of the rebel groups were well disciplined, so we made we were, we were neutral. We made deals with every army which came through there to let us take care of our copy, let us do our work. And they, they weren't trying to wreck the country. They all wanted to rule the country, so they weren't trying to make a big mess of it because they wanted to have the assets for their, for their government. So this was a horrible time for the people of the Congo. Estimates four or five million people died during this time span in the Congo. After the war was over, there was a, a total breakdown in the social structure of the country, and we had problems. Uh, there, there is some illegal logging, but it's still it's very limited because the roads are so bad to get the logs out. Slash and burn agriculture, elephant poaching for meat and ivory, and gold mining. There's a lot of gold in this area, and the major issue is gold mining. And this is a gold, it's a gold pit. It's just pit mining. They just, they just dig a big pit. The problem with gold mining is this is a small area. Actually, it's probably good for the animals after they abandon it. But a lot of people come there. They live off bush meat. They, live off, they bring in a lot of people in there, and they have to eat, so they start hunting, and, they, and, this, is, and, they, and this really gets, it depopulates the wildlife in a wide radius around these gold mines. And, it's, and on top of that, it's inside a reserve. It's illegal. The other thing that complicates things is the wonderful roads of the Congo. This is the Trans-African Highway that runs through the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. And this, and you go, there's be a hole there, and somebody gets stuck, and then it gets out. Then the next truck gets stuck, it gets out, next truck. So you'll be there for a week, waiting your turn to get through the hole. And that's, it just happens, you know. And the rainy season, about eight months of the year, it rains almost every day, part of the day, so it doesn't dry out. And this, the roads are really a disaster. The, the, the Institute in the Congo for Conservation and Nature, the rangers, are a very dedicated group of people. Their job is to protect this reserve and to, you know, work with the local people to enforce the regulations, but also to protect, protect the wildlife, but also to enforce illegal uh, things that go on, such as elephant poaching being the major one in mining. And occasionally there's the squatters and the, and the splash and bird agriculture, but mainly the communities take care of that themselves. So this is a very difficult job. Uh, the roads are so bad, we have trucks, and trucks can only get you so far. Most of it travels by dugout, canoe, and by foot. They go on regular patrols. We fund all work, their patrols, their rations, their work uh, to protect. 
and crossing these rivers when they're high and when flowing is very dangerous. We built an airstrip in about 1994, 95, because it used to take five days to get in there by road, and so we built a small a bush strip, which comes in very handy because we can fly directly in there uh, if there's security in the region. And also it's used for, uh, we, we chart, the, the mission's called MAF, the missionaries in this part of the Congo are, are American missionaries, and their calling is to fly other missionaries around. So they have this wonderful network of American pilots and American planes, and they charge you, but they're there, and they're, they got very well-maintained planes. They're wonderful people, and they dedicate their lives. This is their calling, is to help uh, move missionaries around the Congo. So they're wonderful people, and we use their planes to do the spotting, and this would be a smoke from a poacher's camp, smoking the meat. It's from the air. You can, you can never see this from the ground. You never know where it is, and so we, they can do that. And all the rangers have these Thiraya phones, which is in Africa is a phenomenal satellite phone. It's, that's how big they are. They're all GPS linked, so all the guards can text in, and every time they send a text, it's the, the GPS coordinates are attached, so we know exactly where they are, what's going on. They can say, trouble in this area, all clear in this area, we've been here, and then you actually know where they've been, so you could actually talk. So this is very important for trying to find out where things are going, how things are happening, and, you know, and see trends and, you know, and where movements are, so this actually is a very beneficial thing. One of the things we've, we need to do, and we've always tried to do, is, is to build capacity. The, these, uh, the Congo has been kind of isolated. It's a French-speaking country, and a lot of the technical expertise for this type of management is based in Southern Africa and East Africa. There is a, there is a ranger training camp in Cameroon, but the standards are quite low, and you know, I've met many of the graduates from that school, and it's not, they're not, it's not very good. So we've sent the two gentlemen to left to South Africa. There's a school of wildlife management in South Africa. They spent two years down there learning, and we've also have trainers come in from different parts of Africa, especially French speaking. We've had French foreign legionnaires come in there that have been worked in Central African Republic to speak French, to can treat and train the, uh, the guards. So it's very important to build this capacity because they have a very dangerous job. It's very dangerous. And as you all know, the, uh, the, the, the poachers are becoming more armed and more sophisticated all across Africa these days. This is a, a reserve. It's not a national park. There's 40,000 people that live around the reserve and some live through the reserve. So, Community relations are critical. Without the people's support, without their, their constant agreement to cooperate and to help us and work with us, we would fail. And so it's important that we educate the people. This is a mother with 10 kids. So what are these kids going to do? What, where, how are they going to treat the environment? You have to get to them. We, we're fortunate to have a great group of educators work for the project. We designed the whole school curriculum for conservation. And all the schools in the Congo use a curriculum developed by our educators on, on conservation. And it's a very important uh, part of our project. Conservation education is a broad topic. It ranges from radio broadcasts to sitting down in a mud hut on the floor just talking about the people's problems. It's really a really important thing. Uh, the gentleman on the left is one of our educators, and he's meeting with the elders of a community saying, these are the rules, these are regulations, you know. But then there's a two-way street. So how can we help you? How can we make your life better? if you kind of work with us. So there's a two-way give and take all the time. The woman down below is Jackie. She's one of our women educators against the, the wishes of her family. She's a teacher and she, she travels the reserve on a motorcycle, going to village after village, just talking to the kids about biodiversity, about conservation, and also sustainable use of resources. These people are allowed to use certain resources. It has to be sustainable for those 10 kids will have something when they grow up. If they, you know, if they use everything now, there's nothing for those kids, and they'll be moving to some place that's going to be much more impoverished than where they are. They have natural resources. They can use water, firewood, medicinal plants. There's certain types of uh, agriculture that's allowed in certain areas. We have a wonderful artist that painted these signs all around the reserve in different places and in buildings and on villages, just talking about the biodiversity, how to protect the animals, how unique they are. And these comic books, we, and kids love comic books, and they do love them in the Congo, too. They like the color in them. So we create these little comic books in the bottom. This one's on soya, which is about a bean, a, soy, a soybean, which is a high-protein bean. It's how to grow it. It's all told about how to plant it, how to grow it. How to, so it's actually for everybody to read. There's, well, there's one on elephants, one on okapi, one on chimpanzees, and just talks about the different things. And the kids, of course, they're going to read this to their parents. Most of the kids can read, and the parents can't. So it's actually great that they can read it to their parents. Community assistance, as I was saying, is just reaching out to communities and, and being an, an advocate for their needs and li listening to them. What, what can we do to improve your quality of life as a, 
the, the better their quality of life, the less impact they're going to have on the resources, because they're not going to have to do illegal things. They're not going to have to do things that are actually long-term damaging to the environment. Uh, working with the schools is important. The, one of the, you know, soccer, football to these people over there is a big sport for like any young kid in Africa wants it. So we provide uniforms, we provide soccer balls. And, the, and in exchange for that, the kids are involved in reforestation. We have these special nurseries and areas that are abandoned farm fields, they plant the trees back into the forest. And the thing about rainforest, if the area is small, the trees can't get a start because it's too hot. So you have to grow them to about five or six inches in height, and you plant them, they'll grow. That's why the, these, these areas won't regenerate on their own. So the, the replanting is very important for a lot of the rainforest trees. So we, we grow them from seedlings, give them to the kids, and they plant them. And it's really an amazing program. One of the most important things we can do is clean water. About 90% of human diseases can be eliminated by providing clean water. So we provide these water sources. The women have to get the water. The little girls five years old got to get the water, and they got to walk miles and miles. If you can put these, uh, because, as I said, this soil is very well drained. If you just find a, a natural spring, you put a concrete thing, the water, this water flows out of the ground. It is flowing out of the ground because it just, there's a catchment areas. And it's clean water. It's filtered through, you know, 20, 30 feet of sand. It's really wonderful. So it's, it's safe to drink right out of the faucet there. So we put these in, the, in the many villages as we can. It really it, it improves the quality. They don't have to go so far, and they're not, they can have more time for doing other things. The cooking is very hard. They have to they eat a bean, a lot of beans and rice. It takes a long time to cook these. They have to get the firewood to cook the beans. So a woman is going to spend five or six hours a day getting water, getting firewood, and cooking before she's done anything else. It's really a hard life. So anything we can make easier for them, they have more time to work in their gardens, produce a surplus crop, and have some spending money for, for medical treatments or for school. This is the school we built in Apulu. This, 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 these, uh, it's, it's really amazing the dedication of the parents for the kids to go to school. This school has three sessions, morning, middle of the day, and evening, and because the kids want to go to school. And the parents, we, we used to pay this, the teachers fees, and we thought that was a bad idea because the parents were involved. So we're, you know, we provide the material, we provide, but the parents have to pay the teachers. They have to provide a school fee to pay the teachers. The government doesn't pay anybody. First of all, there's no government support for health care or for education. So this is, all has to come from people from the outside or the people themselves. So this is the, and we found that the parents do a much better job. Uh, they demand more of the teachers if they're, if they're invested in the payment of the teachers because it, bad teachers are a problem in uh, lots of places. Another thing we try to go after is community health care. This is really important because uh, there is no real health care system, so, but there are, we have, these are five nurses that work for us. There's really no doctors in this area. There's only nurses, and these are highly, they go to school, they learn, they're actually very good. Uh, we, you know, it's, it's really funny that all the women come to the clinic to have their babies. You know, and that we, we, you know, it's just, it just that it's good to have this attention, so we're glad they come. So there's 24-hour service here for the maternity, for the mothers coming to have their babies, and then, we, we collect uh, medicines, and the next picture I'll show you is this is a rural clinic. They're all, th this is all around the reserve, and what we provide is the medicines for these clinics because there is no medicines. And they're just basic medicines, but it helps the people. Malaria is still a big problem. Infections are a problem in getting the right treatments. And uh, there, there is a hospital uh, that doesn't have any doctors, used to have doctors, Italian hospital, but there is pretty good care there. So we try to get any, but any critical cases we'll take to the hospital in Mombasa. It's a Catholic mission that runs this hospital. Italian, Italian priests that are wonderful, dedicated, and uh, try to get a better care for them. This is, uh, the staff makes this project successful. And this on the right is Movie, who's in charge of our agroforestry. Uh, Rosie Roof uh, is Swiss on the left there. She's our project on the ground. Her husband Carl and I started the project with Rosie. He was killed in 2003 during the war. And so, uh, you know, Rosie stayed on. She's a remarkable woman and uh, she's really dedicated. She's been in the Congo 30 years now and she really loves the people. And, and uh, I just have to keep her safe as half this problem, keep her out of trouble. Um, <laughs> the people, you can see the poverty here is very it's extreme. This is one of the poorest places on earth. Uh, you know, a, a dollar a month is a salary. It's just really horrible. But agroforestry, so they're meeting with this woman talking about how she can improve her crop yield, how she can do better 
to provide more nutrition for her family. So the movie goes and talks to every village around the reserve and tells them about the agroforestry program. And this is very, un we started this in uh, 19, I think it was about 19, 90, we started the agroforestry program. And it, it's a way, it's, a, it's, a, actually, it's actually a legitimate science. There's a school of agroforestry in Nairobi, Kenya. It's how to grow crops in the rainforest. It's how to grow food without depleting the soils. Rainforest soils are very nutrition poor. One year, maximum two on the same plot of land under their cultivation techniques. By teaching them how to fertilize, use nitrogen fixing plants, how to do other things, they can stay on a plot of, plot of, plot of land five to six years Normally, it would take 15 years for that soil recovery. We plant these lucerne trees among the crop rows. They grow, and they actually they put nitrogen in the soil, but also when they abandon the plot, they shade it out. And a normally, a tough grass would come in and colonize it. You, it's a really unbelievable grass. You can't break through it. People would rather cut virgin rainforest and try to clear the grass. The trees shade out this grass, and they can come back in two or three years and start over again. They can use the trees for firewood or for house structures. So it's actually a system, and we've been there long enough, they see how it works. And by improving the different types of crops, we show them different beans and different types of plants they grow, they increase their crop yield 25%. 25% is a lot because that helps feed their family. There's a surplus they can sell in the market. They have some money for school and for medicine. So it really, and it, and it empowers them. They're in charge of their life. They, they are in control. We have a huge waiting list for farmers at part agroforestry because we provide all the initial seeds, tools, and technical advice for every farmer that joins. We have like 560 farmers in the co-op now. Uh, the women, again, are the major uh, producers and suppliers of food for the family. So working with them is important. We've actually formed these women's co-ops because as a group, they're much more successful. It's really hard to work in a field by yourself. You know, and, and we get... Uh, The, the issue with the, the agriculture is they can do this. And so where agriculture is allowed, you can have agriculture because there's zones within the reserve because it's traditional use. Then there's a forest zone. And the real reason for this is if you let the rainforest get cut like this, it'll never come back. It will never. Zoning allows certain areas that we can, and we use the right techniques. They can stay there. They don't have to. Think. The other issue about going into the forest, you have more contact with monkeys and elephants. So you lose a lot of your crop to animals. And then their people are yelling about the animals and the wildlife. But if they stay closer to villages, there's less impact of the wildlife on their garden. But this is outside the reserve in an area that's actually spread. But once it gets colonized like that, it's, the rainforest is gone forever. And this is what a lot of Uganda used to look like, a lot of Tanzania, a lot of places in Africa used to have the forest cover. And we're, we don't want this to happen you know, to the area around the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. So we've been supporting this project for 25 years. And uh, we had some good success uh, with the people in the program. And actually, it was, it was probably the best run uh, protected area in all the Congo for many years. And we had a good, good group of rangers and good support. And the rangers did, an, I think, would almost, you would say, at, at reflection, a too good of a job. Uh, they were arresting, these are miners, illegal miners, a lot of burning snares they collect in the forest, and then elephant, elephant meat and elephant poaching. And uh, because of the total dis, uh, denigration of the, of the social structure and, the, and the, the military in the Congo is very implicated in all legal, illegal activities. The military is involved in gold mining, poaching, and everything. And that's, that's who's supposed to be defending it. So we were attacked on June 24th by a group of notorious poachers that the, the guards had closed their gold mines, had stopped their elephant poaching, had actually had a couple of engagements where there was firefights and people were killed. They attacked the station, and they killed six people, two guards. They killed our Okapi, and they burned all the structures. That was on June 24th. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't there, or Rosie wasn't there. Usually, I'm there in June. Uh, for some reason this year, uh, that year, I wasn't there in June. Well, usually, that's a month I spend. And so we weren't there because we, you know, it would have been difficult. Uh, the people were, the town was looted. Everything was stolen from all the people, all their goods and their houses, which it wasn't much, just pots and pans and beds and mattresses and you know, their lanterns radios, they were stolen. So we met with the people and we tried to make a, a, a plan. We had a tremendous outpouring support from the zoos and our partners, UNESCO, uh, w Wildlife Conservation Network. And with the money we raised, we provided food relief because everybody lost, had to move away from their gardens. They lost all their food in their houses. They lost all their stores. We provided food from June through January. We provided food twice a month to all the people in the Pulu, all the, all the rangers and their families, all our staff and their families. 
and we were bringing the food in on trucks. Uh, this is a, a, a Mbuti pygmy family. They lost all their pots and pans. They don't have much worldly goods. They just cook in pot, the rice and pots and pans, and so we're replacing their pots and pans and different things like that for the people. And we, we gave household alliance, allowances to all the families who lost everything so they could buy some goods to keep their household together. Uh, during this thing, this is an Echo Warrior flag. It's an, it's an organization in Australia that awards an Echo Warrior flag to rangers that fight for the cause of conservation. So they had just awarded this flag before the attack, so I brought it over with me. Uh, and just uh, these guys have put their life on the line in a, in a very dangerous situation. This is uh, in Congo. It's called Far DC. That's the Congolese Army. And this is uh, soldiers that we brought in to help uh, with the get the control of the area. This, this, port, this poacher's name is, goes by Morgan. He has about 100. Uh, these are Mai Mai. These are a very notorious, uh, ferocious people. They, they, they drive fear, and they all have AK-47s, and rocket launchers is a whole different world. They're just very dangerous, and they have, uh, they're very violent, so they, they scare everybody. So the Army was there. We've had, oh, three operations that, to try to get this, this group, and uh, they haven't been able to get them yet. We just have, we've been trying to find the right army, the on, honest guys. We've had some luck with some different groups, but most of them, uh, when you, you know, they're playing both sides of the fence. You know, they're you know, taking rations from you, and they're actually taking money from these poachers, so it's really a difficult situation, but it's the only option we have right now. This is real forest warfare. This is a thick, you cannot see more than five inches in front of you, and you're trying to, to follow people up. That, and that what's different about this, I'm going to call it a war because it is a war. It's a terrorist war. These people want to drive out the Rangers and us and anybody else for they can exploit this area for their own benefit. They don't help the people. They hurt the people. They trash people's homes. They, they abduct people's porters all the time. They, they, they kill people. They're horrible. They just want to have, be able to, to, to kill elephants for the ivory, and they want to be able to mine for gold. That's all they want. They want no one to stop them, even though this is a protected area. So we just met with the governor in Kisangani, which is part of the region. He's pledged more support. So we have another operation starting probably next week. We got a big grant from UNESCO to, to fund another military operation. But without security and getting this group of people, it's still very dangerous for everybody in the area. And, and, and on top of that, the bridge in Apulu <laughs> collapsed, which means we're totally cut off from the outside world because the, tr the bridge went. It's an overloaded truck. I think the bridge is rated like at 25 tons. I think this truck had 85 tons of lumber in it. But there's no rules in the Congo. <laughs> the only rule is nature's rule. He lost his truck, you know, so. And you'll see. But what's run, I was there a couple times since then. It's amazing resourcefulness of these people. All the trucks on one side would unload. They'd make these homemade boats. They'd bring all the goods across the river. Another truck on that side, load it up and go. But the most common thing I saw was beer, cases of beer on both sides of them. <laughs> you ne you never, you're always going to have beer if you don't have anything else. But <laughs> the bridge was out for four months, and there was tr 100 trucks lined up on one side and 100 trucks lined up on the other, and stuff going back and forth, and, the, and these people would carry one and unboat across. It was amazing to watch them do it. And actually, we're lucky to get the bridge fixed in four months, because sometimes it takes two years to get a bridge fixed in the Congo. These are old bridges built by the U.S. military, Bailey bridges made by the, in 1949, these bridges were built by the U.S. military. One of the strategies is th there's a customary chief, and this is a very traditional African society where a customary chief has a zone of influence, and he, his word is really the law, and so we have to engage these customary chiefs and get them on our side. So we support their administration. They have small administration for, you know, paper, and that we, they all have a motorcycle we gave them for they can communicate with their different villages and things like that. But these are our best forces with the people because <clears throat> the, the customary chiefs have a lot of power, and they actually can rally communities to, to stand up to some of these outrageous uh, attacks. We just had a nice grant from Disney Club Penguin, which is in Canada. They gave us money to... We wanted it, the schools couldn't get any supplies this year because of the road and plus of all the trouble. So we organized uh, school supplies for 100 different, 106 schools. This just, we just, I was just there and we, we distributed these, this, uh, this, this uh, material to all the schools plus nine administrations. Uh, again, you have to load it all in a truck from Bainey, which is about 300 miles away. But then you have to go by the road. <laughs> Our poor guys, they had to go on this road with this truck. And uh, 
they were fortunate they didn't get in trouble. They, they just missed one attack uh, when they went through an area a couple of days later he got attacked. So. so we go to these rural schools and you meet with the principal and the teachers and it's really great and all the kids, I'll tell you, the, the kids are just wonderful. They're just all excited about you know, getting some things. This, these supplies, the only supplies they're getting for school this year that's going to last them to the end of the year. We try to do this every year. We do calendars. We try to do other things for them. But this was really important. So all the teachers, they got books, they got maps, they got pencils, pens. And, they got, and the main thing is chalk for the teachers for the blackboard. It's the simplest thing, just chalk, you know, teachers write on blackboards. And they just have a paint, they just paint on a piece of wood. And that's one of how they teach the kids. And again, we give each school soccer ball and his uniform. This is the biggest hit because they have a uniform and they get a ball and they're all excited for their school soccer team and they all have uh, leagues and play each other and they're all named after animals. There'll be Okapi, Leopard, Elephant, they all have names after animals and so it's actually a great thing and they really appreciate that. Uh, this just shows you a typical market scene and the two guys on the left are work with us so they're picking out food. The rest are women. This is the economy. It's all based on women. They get the plantains. There's charcoal in those bags. And they, they have to get everything to market and sell it. They have to get it and sell it. They have the babies. They're all working there. And that, so the whole economy is based on women. And so if, if you can empower women, there, there's a quality improvement for everybody in society. And, and, there's, a, and there's a greater appreciation for, for things they cannot even think about, like conservation. And this is women getting some of the plants. And we, we've got these uh, indigenous fruit trees we've developed. It's, and we give the people who plant fruit trees around their houses. It does two things. It gives them fruit, but it gives them shade. These, it's about 10 degrees or 15 degrees hotter in the sun than it is in the rainforest. It's really a baking hot. And, if you, and they cut all, and they have these goats, and they eat everything. So we, they, they will protect a fruit tree with protection around it because they'll get something out of it. So we've been uh, handing out these fruit trees, big demand for the fruit trees. And these are women's co-op. Working in the fields together, first of all, it's safer, but also they get a lot more done. They can grow cash crops like peanuts. Manioc's still the staple crop. These are manioc roots they're digging up here. This is the thing they starch. They eat the leaves in the salad and cook it. It's called sambe. They cook it like a spinach. And the roots they make into a, a, a paste and a powder, which they bake like a bread and a porridge. So that's their main staple diet. But working in these little, you can see in the background, these are lucerne trees, how big they are. And that'll, that'll be there, and they'll be between the rows. And then when they abandon this field, it'll take over the whole field, and they can go back there a year or two later. We have these association of mamas. They're called they're women's associations. All the villages have them. We fund them. We give them our administration. Actually, uh, I think next week, week after, we're starting these workshops, but they're all asking, how do they organize themselves? They want to be self-sustaining. The women are very interested in, of course, in improving their lives. We've given them sewing machines because sewing, all the clothes over there come from aid agencies. They dump it in a big pile and people have to pay for it. They know it's never given away free, but it all has to be altered. Nothing fits. So tailors are really big demand. So teaching women to sew, giving them sewing machines is a really important job they can make and they can make some money. But also they want to work with the orphan kids. One of the strongest things we always hear from the women, how can we help the orphan kids? There's lots of orphans. And orphans are not abandoned in the Congo. Somebody looks after them. Somebody takes care of them. They will never let a kid go off by himself. Somebody will take care of that kid. But those people need help to take care of those orphans. So they want to, So this is the women's groups want to help this. They also want to be able to form their own cooperatives. So we're now we're having a workshop on how they can make their own money to fund their own operation. And that's how to reach out to different peoples in the community, how to, you know, to financially manage things they sell for a certain portion goes towards activities they want to do. So it's a we have a two or three of them going on next week in some of the towns around reserve. Unfortunately, we're in a military situation right now. I was just over there with the guards, and I, when I'm in the air, I have to have an escort because I'm a target. I kind of stand out. So, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and uh, we, we've been funding the ICCN for uh, 25 years, and, we, we, and they know that we're, we're the only ones uh, funding them. And the government doesn't fund them, so they only can ex the reserve only exists because of us and our grants from UNESCO and our partners and our funding, and so we 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 have to try to get the situation under control. I, you know, I was I was just there, and it, it, we were able to do a lot of our community work. We're able to get our the agroforestry still going. One of the things we're working on now is the uh, all the seed stocks were stolen when the the group attacked Mombasa in June, January fourth. And that's where we have one of our offices where we kept all the seeds we give out to people for agroforestry. And all the people who have their own seeds, they're all stolen. So we're going to replenish all those seeds because there's, 
there's a certain crops they plant. There's a, there's a bean crop. There's an upland rice crop. There's a certain other crops they plant in certain times of year. You have to have the seeds when the time is right. If you don't have the seeds, you can't grow. You miss the season. So I was there, and I just feel that we have a, you know, we got to get the situation resolved. The government's pledging more support. We've got a lot of international pressure. President Kabil has pledged his support. But our, what we're fighting is a, is a corrupt military. And we're really fighting a corrupt military. And uh, so we're just hoping we have another operation. If we can get control of the area, uh, we can continue. But right now, it's still a very tenuous situation. But all the parks in the, the Virunga National Park is under siege by this rebel group called M23. Caiza Bayega with the lowland gorillas, Salonga, they all have problems right now. The country is a, is a big uh, disaster. And so, you know, I, I never, I've always learned never say it can't get worse, because it always does. But uh, hopefully we're at the bottom now and we're coming up. But we're committed. Our donors are committed. And we have a phenomenal staff. And these guys, these rangers on the ground, are some of the bravest people I know on this planet fighting in a really tough situation. So we're continuing going forward. You know, for the, the ghost of the forest, for an okapi to exist, it needs protection. The, you, the okapi is not hunted, you know, caged. I think there's the last 10 years, we know of maybe two okapi poached. There's probably 10,000 okapi in the Atori forest. There's a healthy population, but they need trees and they need peace and quiet. If there's a lot of human disturbance, they'll leave an area. And if they go into an, an area that's not suitable for them, the leaf, leaves, uh, the plant species aren't there to support them nutritionally, they won't survive. So our goal is to keep the forest intact and keep the people, you know, the elephants, and you're all familiar with the elephant crisis, the elephant crisis really is driving a lot of this. This price of ivory is like the price of gold, and the price of gold is the price of gold, and we have both of those problems in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, and a lot of people on the outside, there's, a, there's an organization in the Congo that's trying to, get, like they did with diamonds, having fair trade gold, because the gold sold in Tiffany's, and the United States, and here, it's coming out of the Congo, and it's, so, it's sold by the military, they take that money and they buy weapons and they intimidate people and they run. And so this, it's a direct link to the glitter and gold and the people suffering in the Congo. There's no doubt, just like there was for diamonds, there was for, for the, for the coal tan in your cell phones, the exact same thing. A big movement to stop that and it's going to be hard to do that. But in the meantime, we just got to keep trees standing. And that's what we're trying to do and, and, and keep the people that want to harm the wildlife and the people. You know, the people are suffering. We're trying to stop that too. So we're continuing to do the best we can, and we're committed. And so I just uh, thank you for listening, and I, I can take a few questions. Thank you. Well, they're not that all that all bad, but <laughs> but you know. A lot, a number of the men work in the, our project are very hard workers. People that are guards are hard workers. People go to the different larger towns to get a job in some kind of commerce. But there is a certain group of men that just sit around talking all day, and that's what they've always done. Their, you know, from the hit, so that's it. And they are men that that work in the fields, do do that. You know, they are do that, but they're they're a minority, and so it's kind of the role that's been gone to women and. There, there's a very big dichotomy in Congo because Kinshasa on the western side, the capital, very European influence. The women there are highly educated, college educated, very articulate. There's a lot of women in parliament in the Congo. Then you get on the eastern side, it's got this very rural economy based on a uh, class structure of three, four, five hundred years old. So it's going to take a lot to change that, but it can change. And the, it, if the women are producing food and surplus income, they have a lot of power over the men. You know, they, 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 they can do what they want with that, and they take care of the kids come first. You don't want to mess with a Congolese woman when it comes to their kids. You know, they, even the father knows that. So, um, but they're, they're not all, it's, it's not a matter of laziness, it's a matter of, uh, of the culture. You know, their, their job is to sit around and talk about how things ought to be. You know, I think that's about it, so. Yeah, I get very discouraged. I, I, for your answer, I, I, they'd be going out the family would be going out to Ashamba, which is their garden, to work, and the tump line with all the tools on the mother, and the little kids got the tools, and the father's calling, carrying the transistor radio. <laughs> 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 so he's going to sit down and listen to the radio while they're working. So, <laughs> but that, that will change. Uh, AIDS problem. There, yes, it, it, there's an AIDS problem. I think it's uh, been kind of glossed over, you know, by the country, but basically the doctors and the nurses I talk to, and there definitely is an AIDS problem. 
it, we've lost uh, staff members to AIDS. Actually, we lost one of our best nurses to AIDS, so it is definitely a problem. It, but, you know, the problem with war and AIDS and diseases, the, in, 20 years ago, it was 50 million people in the Congo. Today, there's 80 million. There's still this huge population surge. So a lot of these problems are not really going to be a problem when you have this huge level of poverty and population growth, even under the most difficult circumstances. The, there is a lot of education about AIDS. We, we provide, uh, it's called CETA in French, CETA, a lot of CETA uh, education. It's not um, glossed over or, or taboo topic. People are aware of it. What you have is a lot of truck drivers, you have a lot of prostitution, you have a lot of ways that AIDS, and I, I don't know if you're familiar, but, but AIDS in Africa is, is a heterosexual disease, is much more prevalent in the heterosexual communities, and that's where it's spread through the prostitution, truck drivers, people going home, communities. And there, people are aware of it. There's a lot of move for condom distribution. There's a, um, and I think you know, from the people, the Congolese I know, they, they know about it. They know what it is and how you get it. And you know, that's the way it is. And there's a, it's not as bad as Uganda. I know it's not as bad as Uganda issues with AIDS. Uh, but there is still a lot of rural pockets of communities which there's no exposure to the outside world. It's actually just you know, these closed systems. So I think that's why it's not as bad. Yeah, that th yeah, there are people about the ex-military coming in, and it's it it would be very counterproductive to to do that, you know, without the government supporting it. And the government of the Congo is very wary of outside forces because they're in such a, a you know a, a political and military upheaval now. And that would be someone like coming in to take over the country, not to fight poachers. They would not assume that they're going to come in to fight poachers. They're going to assume they're going to come and try because the, the government is so tenable and uh, very weak that it wouldn't take much to throw the, the country into total, total civil war. So we've talked to, there's several groups of, we've talked to, we brought in people from the French Warren Legion with the government support for training and help, and I was involved in Grama National Park for the Rhino Foundation. We had a lot of, uh, they could only be trainers, they couldn't be military active, and you know, we have a contract with the government, we are partners with the government of the Congo, we can't go against their wishes, you know. and. That we have very well-trained rangers, and there are a good guard force. It's just a matter of having, you know, having the better people, the right people on their side, and not against them. That's we, you know, and that's that's political. You know, we've got a few generals removed. We got a few lieutenant commandos arrested and brought to Kinshasa. So we're trying to pick off the military that we know, and we have some influence that they, they've actually been acting on some of the, the information. So it's going to take a little bit of momentum like that. You know that. W and I would, I don't, you know, you're talking about mercenary, this environment is the toughest environment you ever can imagine. And our rangers are the best for this. They, they train, they live there, they, they're in the forest all the time, and uh, we just don't have enough of them. That's the only problem. We got maybe 40 guards that can actually go into the forest, and there's 100, 200 people in, the, in these poaching groups that are very well armed, very well armed. Yeah, the, the rhino poaching uh, situation is quite uh, endemic throughout Africa and you know the, the, the South African have a special uh, military force for anti-poaching they're highly trained and I think better than most American mercenaries and these uh, they're, they're doing uh, trying to do a good job but it's just a, it's getting under control like you know uh, you know we're getting reports of some improvement you know and uh, more arrests in southern Africa they are prosecuting people putting them away for 20 years for rhino poaching so we're seeing some real progress there. You know, Kenya's had some losses recently, and they're trying to get their handles uh, handle on that. There is some problems in the, you know, some of the rhino populations are so small, they're not affected because the numbers are so small, but some of the place, Southern Africa is the main issue there. Uh, we work in Asia, and there's not really a problem with the, you know, the poaching like there is in Africa. But you know, Vietnam just signed, most of these rhino horn has been going to Vietnam that's been poached in Africa recently, signed an agreement to stop all this import of rhino horn kind of vague document, but I think it's, we have an NGO on the ground we're working with in Vietnam that's going to probably work on that. I don't know if you know, but the, the issue, we get away from Okapi, but it's similar rhinos, uh, that the, the rhino horn use has evolved into a, a, a high society, almost like a recreational drug in Vietnam, and there's no middleman anymore. You buy it, and they use it for binge drinking, cleansing, and they call it the Ferrari, the Ferrari drug over there. It's all the, the real high wealthy new set of Vietnamese people are using it, and so it, it's, it's hard to attack that 
it's not like you can go to a store and say you're selling rhino horn because it's, it's, it's like drug dealing. It's just everywhere and it's, it's, it's insidious. So that we're trying, it's just not getting out of the country, stopping them getting out of the country and stopping the poachers on the ground. It's going to take a while, but we're seeing some, some improvement, but we've got a long way to go for the rhino. Still, rhino populations are increasing. I know people lose sight of this. You know, even though this, this, there was 500 something rhinos killed in South Africa, there's still the population growth exceeded that, you know, in Southern Africa rhinos. So actually, the poaching is bad and it's horrible to control, but the rhino populations are, you know, where they are stable, are increasing. They do, they do produce, reproduce pretty well. I get the United States, the first thing I say, how can anybody in this country ever complain about anything? First thing I remember. <laughs> you know, I, all I, I come home and everybody's complaining about this, Democratic Republic, this tax, this, that, and the other. Well, you don't have a clue. <laughs> no, my, coming to my mind is, you know, how we're going to how we're going to get control of the situation it's 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 really something that i can't do you know we can't do it's got to be a government induced and we're we're using all our political pressure we have uh, we have a special mission with unesco that's met with the different people we've met with the governor kissingani we have some strong strength and so we just have to there's, there's re really to me this is a, a it's a it's really a major issue if uh, a group of poachers can uh, destabilize a national protected area and actually eliminate its protection would be a, really a first in Africa. It doesn't happen. You know, it gets bad in Africa. It may, there's parks that don't have any protection, but they still exist. So what we're trying to say is you can't let this happen. You, this is, they, they have a wonderful biodiversity in the Congo. It needs protection, but you have to make it a priority. And that's what we're trying to say. It's got to be a priority. You know, what's happened now is there's no income from the national parks. When they had the, the, the mountain gorilla visits in Virunga, you know, they would make a lot of money from that. The government made a lot of money. Now there's closed. There's so much trouble in Virunga, there's no tourists going to the Virungas for gorillas. You know, we had some tourism, Keys of Viegas, long, so there's no, so what's happened is in the Congo, the, gu, the, the ministries and departments that generate income for the government get priority. Mining, timber, you know, that kind of thing is going to give them the priority. If, if the minister of the environment goes in and he's got no money to put on the table, he's just, that can't be important. We got guys over here going to want to have gold mines, uranium mines, titanium mines. They want to cut trees. They want to. They want water. They want something. And so that's really we have to make it a higher level. And that, that's where the international community. We have some of the leaders. World Bank is really involved here. You know, we're trying to get USAID involved, and so we're trying to put pressure. We have to bring resources to the table to actually influence the government. So it's just nice. It's, there's so much, so many problems. Like just people say, look, we have this one problem. There's a there's a uh, a rebel group in near Bunya, which is out to the on the map west uh, east part of the country. This guy named Cobra has 10,000 followers, 10,000 followers, and he's in negotiation with the government now. He's not causing any trouble. M23 has thousands of followers. They're in negotiation with the government. If these talks fail with these rebel groups, and the rebel groups just want it's not like a bad thing. They want things to improve. They want the government's doing nothing as part of the country. They say, well, if you can't do it, we'll do it. You know, we'll take over the country and we'll do it. So it's really a tenuous situation. So I, when I come home, I say, you know, I don't, I can have a hard time figuring. So we just got to keep plugging, trying to hold what we can together and hold the staff together until this thing kind of works its way out because it's going to have to, it's going to have to work out. Because th there was just a, an agreement signed in Addis Ababa, but all the Central African countries agreeing that they have to work together to, de to stabilize the eastern part of the Congo. It, is a, it, 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 it could take the whole continent into a major, major downturn in civil war. If Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, and maybe CAR can get involved in a war in the Congo, it is going to destabilize the whole region, and they, people know that. And, uh, and so it, we, there's an there initiative now where the African countries are going to step up, and they said they will actually put money and armed forces into policing this area and, and try to, and that's one hope we have that the African uh, Congress and the African countries themselves will say this is so important, we gotta do something about it. And that's where we're, it looks like they're taking some steps there, but there's been lots of treaties signed in Africa that mean nothing too, so. Well, I think yes, there is, you know, pristine, you know, we, we gotta realize that people have been living in Africa 
for a long time. That's where we came from. So, you know, and so, you know, pristine to us, and, you know, there's always been Mbuti pygmies running around the rainforest in the Congo, and there's been, you know, Maasai herders and, you know, and the different types in, in Bushmen and people in the Kalahari. So pristine it, natural systems functioning, and I think we have to include the human element at a minimal level. Yeah, I think the Kalahari and Botswana is that way, and the Salu in Tanzania, and I think there's lots of rainforest in the Congo that, you know, in, in Salonga where the bonobos are, it's just wild and stuff. And pristine's a funny word, like it means untouched, but, you know, this has all been touched by humans, you know, for a long time. And you, you got to put that in your equation. You have to factor it in. You have to actually encourage that part of the equation to be responsible. Because if you don't think about that part of the equation, you're, you're not going to be succeed. So you got to say, how can if we try to get the people to be responsible? And they are, they realize this is, this is something they can do that makes sense for them. We can't offer, you know, in most countries in Africa, they offer tourism as a panacea for people's problems and some micro enterprises sell a few things. Uh, we don't even have that option. So it's just a matter of trying to, you know, provide the assistance we can on a minimal level to help people. Well, the, influ the influence is, is, you know, entirely negative from the occupation by Belgium, which was a horrific, horrific occupation of cruelty and domination over a people. The slave trade before that for hundreds of years, you know, hauling people out of the interior. So, the, you know, the feeling and then the, the reaction was to that from Mobutu was to go a total way, you know, made friends with China, went away from the western part of the world. But right now, the influence is, it, 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 you know, it, it varies. You know, there's not like an animosity against Westerners. It's just the idea that I think Westerners are who provide the funds for they can actually, you know, have a life. So I think there's a positive part there. I don't see any animosity in Western. But if, you know, adopting our, our way of life is, is, uh, is a far dream for most of them. You know, it's really a, and I don't think a lot of them want that, but there's not an animosity. The Western influence, uh, they have their own music, they have their own languages, they have their own art, they have, you know, it's not, the, but the, the main is the, the idea of selling things that don't belong to you. That's the Western influence that's really strong. That's what gets all this trouble. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.